In the beginning, Uranome, the goddess of all things, rose naked from chaos. She is also called Phanes by the Greeks in the Orphic Theogony. The Sumerian name for her was called Yahu, Exalted Dove, a title which later passed to Jehovah as the creator. It was a dove that Marduk symbolically sliced her into two at the Babylonian Spring Festival, known as Akitu, when he inaugurated the New World Order. The ancient Pelasgians, mentioned by the Greek poet Homer, were a mysterious and enigmatic people who played a significant role in early Greek mythology and history. Homer describes them as a prehistoric civilization, often associated with the region of Thessaly and the city of Argos. However, the exact origins and characteristics of the Pelasgians remain a subject of debate among historians and scholars. According to Homer, the Pelasgians were a people who lived in the time before the Trojan War and were associated with the construction of massive structures such as the walls of Mycenae and the palaces of the Minoan Crete in Gnosis. They were considered skilled builders and were often depicted as a semi-divine or legendary group. Homer describes the Cretans as an ancient civilization that had 90 city-states surrounded by the palace at Gnosis. Some ancient Greek writers even suggested that the Pelasgians were the original inhabitants of Greece, predating other Greek-speaking tribes. Among the Pelasgians dwelling in Crete were the Dorians, who in Greek is gifted people. The historical reality of the Pelasgians is complex and elusive as they appear in various ancient Greek texts with different interpretations. Some scholars argue that they were a distinct ethnic group, while others propose that the term Pelasgian was used to refer to various indigenous populations of the Aegean region. Ultimately, the true identity and nature of the Pelasgians remain shrouded in the midst of antiquity, leaving us fragments of mythology and historical accounts that continue to intrigue and fascinate to this day. The Proto-Indo-European ancestors of the Greeks in and around the Black Sea region are generally believed to be these very people who are also called Proto-Greeks and Mycenaean Greeks, even going back to the Minoan Linear A pre-Greeks. The Mycenaean civilization of the mainland Greece, which flourished from around 16th to 12th century BCE, is considered important precursor to classical Greek civilization. These Mycenaeans were a part of a broader group of Indo-European speakers who migrated into the Balkans and Anatolia during the Bronze Age. These migrations are often associated with the expansion of the Indo-European language family, which includes Greek as one of its branches. The exact origins of the Proto-Greeks are still a subject of ongoing research and debate among historians and philologists. The Mycenaeans established a powerful civilization centered around the southern part of mainland Greece, with major centers such as Mycenae, Pylos, and Tyrans. They were skilled warriors, traders, and builders, known for their impressive palaces and fortifications. Their culture and language laid the foundation for the later development of ancient Greek civilization. It's important to note that while the Mycenaeans 
and their language are considered a significant part of the Proto-Indo-European ancestry of the Greeks. The complex history of ancient migrations and cultural interactions in the region makes it difficult to attribute the Greek population exclusively to a single ancestral group, such as the Pelasgians. However, civilization around the Black Sea region has had a long, rich history, dating back thousands of years, millennia even. The area has been inhabited by various cultures and civilizations since ancient times. The earliest evidence of human habitation in this region can be traced back to the Stone Age, also called Paleolithic around 45,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago. In terms of more complex civilizations, one of the notable early cultures in this region was the Kukuteni Tripilian culture, which flourished around 5,500 to 2750 BCE. This Neolithic culture was known for its advanced agriculture, pottery, and sizable settlements and could very well be what Homer thought were the Pelasgians. Moving forward in the timeline, the Black Sea region saw the rise and fall of various ancient civilizations. The ancient Greeks established numerous colonies along the coast of the Black Sea. From the 8th century BCE, the Miletians fostering trade and cultural exchange in this region known as the Bosporus, modern-day Ukraine. In the classical period, the region became a melting pot of cultures, with influence of Greek, Persian, Scythian, Thracian, and later Roman civilizations shaping its history. The Bosporan Kingdom, centered in present-day Crimea, emerged as a Hellenistic state in the 5th century BCE, lasting all the way until the 4th century in the Common Era. During medieval era though, the Black Sea region witnessed the presence of the Byzantines, Bulgarian, and Khazar empires, among others. The rise of the Muslim Ottoman Empire in the 14th century brought significant changes to the region, with the Ottoman dominance lasting until the early 20th century. Given this rich and diverse historical backdrop, civilization in this Black Sea region spans several millennia, with different cultures and civilizations leaving their mark on the region's heritage. I am one of the people who believe that this is the region that Homer was talking about when he spoke about the Pelasgians who came down into Mycenaean Greece and Minoan Crete. This culture, stretching back to 10,000 BCE, in and around the same time that Gobekli Tepe shows up on the radar. This Pelasgian culture, as it's called by Homer, has arguably the oldest religion in the world. This religion would be the main influence for both the Sumerian and Mediterranean world, as well as later Indian culture, the Hindus and the Vedics. Do we have anything to show for? The answer is no. However, this Pelasgian creation myth has been reconstructed by Robert Graves in the 20th century. And here's how he did it. If you've seen my last video on the older version of Genesis that predates the Bible, that's a theogony written by Philo of Byblos in the first century who cites a Bronze Age priest named Sanko Niathan from the region of the Phoenicians. With that theogony side by side with the Orphic theogony and the theogony of Hesiod, as well as Sumerian tablets, Homer's Iliad, geography by Pausanias, the Argonautica, and John Zetes, also using Pliny the Elder's history, Robert Graves was able to reconstruct the Pelasgian creation myth and here is how it goes. The Pelasgian creation myth, the oldest creation myth 
in the world. In the beginning, Uranome, the goddess of all things, rose naked from chaos, but found nothing substantial for her feet to rest upon, and therefore divided the sea from the sky, dancing lonely upon its waves. She danced toward the south, and the wind set in motion behind her seemed something new and apart with which to begin a work of creation. Wheeling about, she caught hold of this north wind, rubbed it between her hands, and behold, the great serpent, Ophion. Uranome danced to warm herself wildly and more wildly until Ophion grown lustful coiled about those divine limbs and was moved to couple with her. Now the north wind, who is also called Boreas, fertilizes, which is why mares often turn their hindquarters to the wind and breed foals without aid of a stallion. So. Uranome was likewise got with child. Next, she assumed the form of a dove, brooding on the waters and the waves, and in due process of time laid the universal egg. At her bidding, Ophion coiled seven times about this egg until it hatched and split into two out tumbled all things that exist, her children, which were sun, moon, planets, stars, the earth with its mountains and rivers, trees, herbs, and living creatures. Uranome and Ophion made their home upon Mount Olympus, where he vexed her by claiming to be the author of the universe. Forthwith, she bruised his head with her heel, kicked out his teeth, and banished him to the dark caves below the earth. Next, the goddess created seven planetary powers, setting a titaness and a titan over each. Thea and Hyperion for the sun, Phoebe and Atlas for the moon, Dione and Creus for the planet Mars, Metis and Coeus for the planet Mercury, Themis and Euromedon for the planet Jupiter, Tethys and Oceanus for Venus, Rhea and Cronus for the planet Saturn. But the first man was Pelasgus, ancestor of the Pelasgians. He sprang from the soil of Arcadia, followed by certain others, whom he thought to make huts and feed upon acorns and sew pigskins tunics, such as poor folks still wear, in Euboea and Phocis. That concludes the oldest creation myth ever. And in this archaic religious system, there were, as yet, neither gods nor priests, but only a universal goddess and her priestess, women, being the dominant sex, and man, her frightened victim. Fatherhood was not honored, conception being attributed to the wind, the eating of beans, or the accidental swallowing of an insect, inheritance was the matrilineal and snakes were regarded as incarnations of the dead. Uranome, which means wide wandering, was the goddess's title as the visible moon. She is also called Phanes by the Greeks in the Orphic Theogony. The Sumerian name for her was called Yahu, exalted dove, 
a title which later passed to Jehovah as the creator. It was a dove that Marduk symbolically sliced her into two at the Babylonian Spring Festival, known as Akitu, when he inaugurated the New World Order. This god, Yahu, who was a goddess, became synchronized with Marduk, who was already synchronized from Dumuzi and a pre-Semitic god known as Zababa. And Zababa, who is represented by the full moon, would be the origin of the word Shabbat, which in Babylonian means full moon. And the Babylonians celebrated this Shabbat every full moon with rest. This god Sababa, who appears in Anatolia, as well as Sumer and other places, is the origin of the god Sabatios, worshipped on the island of Crete by the Minoans and brought into the Phrygian religion as well, who was married to the mountain god Kababa, later known as Kybele, and Sabatios is identified by the Greeks as Dionysus or Bacchus, the underworld son of God. The Thracians who worship this god as Zelmoxis, as Herodotus states here, the Gitai, the bravest of the Thracians and the most just, they believe they are immortal, forever living in the following sense. They think they do not die and that when one who dies joins Zelmoxis, a divine being, some call this divine being Gebelizis. Gebel is this, is broken down into two different words. Gebel or Kybele and Zeus, Kybele's Zeus. Every four years, they send a messenger to Zelmoxis who was chosen by chance. They ask him to tell Zelmoxis what they want on that occasion. The mission is performed in the following way. Men standing there for that purpose hold three spears. Other people take one who is sent to Zalmoxis by his hands and feet and fling him into the air on the spears. If he dies pierced, they think that divinity is going to help them. If he does not die, it is he who is accursed and they declare that he is a bad person. And after he has been charged, they send one another. The messenger is told the request while he is still alive. The same Thracians on other occasions, when he thunders and lightens, shoot up the arrow up in the air against the sky. The menace and menace the divinity because they think there is no God other than this God. Herodotus asserts that Zalmoxus was originally a human being who is this God incarnate, a slave who converted the Thracians to his beliefs. He was a slave of Pythagoras and was initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries near Athens. He built a banquet hall and received the chiefs and his fellow countrymen at a banquet. He taught that neither his guests nor their descendants would ever taste death, but instead would go to a place where they would live forever in complete happiness. He then dug an underground residence. When it was finished, he disappeared from Thrace, living for three years in his underground residence. The Thracians missed him and wept for him in mourning. During the fourth year, he rose back up again, and thus they believed that Zelmoxis was Sabazios incarnate. These very Thracians are the origins of the Orphic mysteries. As time went by, as Aristotle talks about, and Iamblichus as well, Zalmoxis became identified with Saturn or Kronos, and in the regions of Phrygia and Cappadocia, he himself would be known as Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, and the origins of monotheism in the Greek world come from this very line. Menasius of Petre, who also identified Zalmoxis with Kronos, says that he was worshipped side by side with the hearth mother. In Plato's writings, Zalmoxis is mentioned as a skilled in the arts of an incantation. His realm as a god is not very clear, as some considered him to be a sky god. And it's possible that the origins of heaven come from this god as well.
There are a group of scholars who believe that this, these Getai, like the other Proto-Indo-Urian peoples, were polytheistic. Diodorus of Sicily tells us that the Getai worshipped Hestia and Zalmoxis as the two prime beings who ruled over a lesser divinities of daemons, at least. When you look at the spelling of Zelmoxis and break down what his name means, the word Zelm, coming from the root Zemelo, which means earth, is also cognate with Semele. So Zelmoxis, like Dionysus, is the son of Semele, earth-born, Chthonian son of God. And if you look at his depictions, he has the moon on his head like horns and he stands on top of a lunar bowl. Zababa was the god who was replaced by Ninurta, whose name means full moon. The parallels between Selmoxis, Dionysus, Saturn, and Zababa are uncanny and cannot be ignored, especially when we look at him being worshipped side by side with the Queen of Heaven, or Kybele. With that being said, write in the comments what you think about these Pulaskian myths and gods that are worshipped in the regions of Thrace and, and Phrygia, this Black Sea region, which happens to be the same location where Gobekli Tepe is, one of the oldest religious sites in the world. What do you guys think about this? Leave it in the comments. You have just attained true gnosis.